All right, hello and welcome everyone to our monthly uh, Saga talks. Welcome to all the Saga members and members from Affiliated Society and everyone who tuned in for the talk. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank our corporate members, Anglo American and the Beers, uh, for supporting Saga um, in these challenges, especially in these challenging times. And if you are tuning in and uh, you're part of the company that would like to get involved and become Saga corporate member, I'll post corporate inf membership information uh, in the chat. Also huge thanks to University of Advisors Runs uh, for co-hosting the talk on their MS team platform. Um, Dave, you can start sharing your presentation. Um, I also have just one announcement to make. Um, those Saga members who haven't had the opportunity to pay your Saga membership fees, uh, just a reminder uh, to please pay your fees when the stand is difficult times and exceptional circumstances, but your fees contribute towards the running of our organization and our ability to organize and host events. Um, to everyone that's tuning in, um, please remember to type your questions in the chat window during the talk. Um, and I'll read them out at the end of the presentation. There's a slight delay between um, when you're seeing uh, the slides and, um, you know, when the talk starts and the talk ends. So it would be good if you type in the questions during the talk so I can summarize them at the end. We'll also be hosting a catch up um, on Google Chat after the talk. Uh, so please join us via the link I'll, I'll post in the chat window. And today's talk on magnetic resonance geophysical methods for groundwater investigations is kindly presented by Dave, Dave Walsh, who's joining us from Seattle, Washington. Um, I hope the weather in Seattle right now is better than in Johannesburg, where it's quite overcast and rainy. Um, Dave is a president of Vista Clara and is a it's a business focused on developing manufacturing magnetic resonance geophysical instruments for groundwater and environmental investigations. Dave received his um, uh, Bachelor of Science degree in electrical engineering from Iowa State University, his master's and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from University of Arizona. Dave has been the president of Vista Clara since 1997. His contributions to the field include development and commercialization of the world's first multi-channel surface NMR instrument and development and commercialization of the world's first small diameter NMR borehole logging tools. Um, Dave, I'm going to transfer. I'm going to share your presentation. Just give me one second. And I'm going to share your video and the floor is yours. OK, can you hear me all right? Yep, read you loud and clear. All right, well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to um, present this today. Uh, I'm going to um, kind of keep the, uh, the presentation on a, a scientific level. Um, first of all, what is magnetic resonance? It's a good question. Um, it's basically it's a non-invasive method to directly detect hydrogen and it's also applicable to a few other types of um, elements but hydrogen is the uh, is the main one that we're concerned with in uh, in groundwater and in geophysics so 
uh, a hydrogen atom. Let me get switched to the. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to get the pointer. Laser pointer, here we go. So a hydrogen atom, uh, basically it's a it's got a single charge on it, a positive charge and uh, the proton and it's in it's spinning. And so therefore um, it, it acts kind of like a current loop and it, it therefore has sort of a dipole magnetic moment. So uh, most uh, a lot of uh, elements do not have this property. Hydrogen is one that does. Um, so what we're basically doing with uh, magnetic resonance is we're detecting the very small magnetic moment of the hydrogen proton. And it's such a small moment that you can't detect it if there's only one. Uh, you have to have a very large, uh, a large number of protons to have any hope of detecting it. But, um, you know, billions and trillions of uh, hydrogen atoms uh, can certainly give you enough of a moment to detect. So uh, the other thing about magnetic resonance is that there's a, it's a sort of a resonant phenomenon. And so the way you detect it is actually by causing an excitation at a particular frequency at which the proton will respond to a, an external magnetic field. And we'll describe that in a couple of slides. But that's basically it. Uh, it's non-invasive. You don't have to touch it. Then that'd be contact to, to detect the hydrogen. And another key point is it is not a radioactive technique. It doesn't require a radioactive source. And that's a um, that's a common uh, misconception about nuclear magnetic resonance because it's got the name, it's got the word nuclear in it. So we sometimes we don't even use the word nuclear. Oh, that's that's the um, scientifically more accepted term, nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR. So where let's see, where is magnetic resonance used? Um, originally, it was developed in chemistry in the 1940s. And it's used widely in organic chemistry and pharmaceutical industries and all sorts of uh, applications, uh, basically to map out and um, understand chemical bonds, chem chemical bonds at a, at a molecular level. And uh, I won't get into it here, but if you had a course in uh, uh, mag um, organic chemistry, you may recall this. So you have individual bonds in a particular molecule can cause very slight shifts in the resonant frequency and with a powerful enough uh, magnet and machine you can resolve these um, these different frequency shifts and use them to identify exactly what the compound consists of another uh, very widely used uh, application of magnetic resonance is in medicine with medical mri in this case you have a you have a, a machine that the person you put a person inside of it and uh, the objective is to image the, the body so that you can diagnose disease and injury. And uh, a third um, widely used is in oil and gas in uh, borehole logging. And so that's one of the things we're doing in groundwater. So this is not, it's not new, it's just a different, it's a different field of application to the oil and gas sector. So how does it work specifically? Well, you need, First of all, you have to have uh, hydrogen protons. And um, the magnetic moments of a hydrogen proton uh, in general, if in the absence of any sort of external field, will just be randomly oriented. And therefore, the bulk quantity of uh, volume of water or whatever fluid you're trying to detect will not have any magnetic moment. So the first thing you need to do a magnetic resonance measurement is a static magnetic field. In this case, where you, where using a, a icon of a um, just a bar magnet to sort of uh, give give an idea of how this works. So if you have a static magnetic field, just like compass needles tend to align in the direction of the North Pole, same thing happens with the hydrogen atoms. So you use a static magnetic field to orient and polarize the water magnetically. So the second thing, the second thing is to get them to rotate. So the second step is at one particular frequency, which is directly proportional to the strength of the static field, you have a resonance. That means that the, the water will respond, the hydrogen atoms will respond to an external 
magnetic field, an alternating magnetic field at that frequency. And they respond by spinning around in phase. So it's kind of like if you had a magnet and you were driving it with a, a some sort of a magnet, kind of like the way an electric motor works. You're driving it with an induction coil and that causes the magnets to physically move in, in phase with that external field. So the hydrogen atoms are rotating around in phase at a particular frequency after the excitation process. And then the third step is to detect. And so basically to detect, you just turn off your exciting field and, you, and these protons will continue to, for some period of time, rotate in phase and that generates a secondary alternating magnetic field that's detected typically by using another induction coil. All right, so that's kind of the uh, the most uh, difficult part of this talk, just trying to get the basics and trying to understand them. So how does this relate? How does the NMR signal relate to a hydrology then? So here on the left, let's say we've got this uh, uh, earth material of some sort. Maybe there's sediments there, but there's water in between the, in the pore spaces. So the first thing is that the total water content in the volume of investigation, that is whatever the, the particular sensor is sensitive to, the total water content is the NMR signal amplitude is directly and linearly proportional to the total water content. So it's a direct measurement of water content, volumetric water content. And if the medium is fully saturated, then it is a direct measurement of porosity. So that's very interesting on its own, They're very useful. So the second thing about the NMR signals, it's got an initial amplitude, but then it also decays over time. It doesn't continue to rot these spins don't continue to rotate forever after you've excited them. So it turns out the thing that governs that relaxation rate, as we call it, or the decay rate of the detected NMR signal is usually interactions between individual water molecules and poor, poor and grain surfaces inside the material. So basically, if you've got water that's in a large pore, these interactions don't happen as regularly and therefore you can have a long signal. The signal NMR signal tends to have a long relaxation time for water in large pores and a fast relaxation time, a short relaxation time for water that's in small pores. So that's how NMR can be used to differentiate between water that is mobile, let's say in um, sands and gravels or large fractures versus water that is immobile. That is, it's in very small uh, pores that are Water is bound by capillary forces or else in clay. So this is basically, uh, if you've got your geologic material like we have here, you've got a combination of large and small pores. There's no natural material that's going to have all the same size pore. You generally have a distribution. So the NMR signal is, is going to be a, a super linear combination of all of these signals, small and short. So you have a Typically, an NMR signal will have a multi-exponential decay rate that reflects the pore size distribution, or at least the relative pore size distribution. So water that's in really small pores, like this little space here, is going to have a faster relaxation time, and water in these bigger pores, larger geometries, will contribute a signal that lasts for a longer period of time. And so just by integrating different parts of this curve. So basically, here's your here's your model. And you can convert your model is basically a, a, pore, a, a relative pore size distribution here. So you can characterize all of the water that's in the short pores, the small pores as being bound just by a, a, applying a cutoff in this time to, time domain distribution. And so this isn't a direct measurement of bound in mobile water. It's an estimate, but it's it's based on um, empirical and this understanding of, of where those cutoffs happen in different types of material. Finally, you can use this pore size distribution and the some other derivative, NMR measured derivative, such as the amplitude, the porosity, or the mean log of the T2 relaxation to estimate permeability. 
So this is one one step further from a direct measurement. It is just an estimate. It's based on a some sort of an empirical model. That's the relation between the NMR signal and hydrology. How do we infer hydrogeological properties from the NMR signal? Now, there are different types of uh, instrumentation that use NMR in geophysics. And basically, they, they're all doing the same type of measurement. They're all doing an NMR measurement in, a, in the cases that we're, we're usually working in, trying to determine hydrogeological properties in native earth formation material. But these uh, different methods, they look a lot different because they're, they're um, basically using different magnet geometries and different types of detection, different types of instrumentation that have different sensitivities. So for example, in surface magnetic resonance, you're using the Earth's magnetic field as the static field. And so this is uh, completely non-invasive. You have a big loop of wire that sits on the ground and you're generating your excitation fields from that loop of wire, generally detecting the signal using the same wire. Borehole NMR logging is much different. In this case, you've got magnets in the probe in the, in the tool that's going down the borehole and they're creating a sensitive zone that's hopefully inside outside of the disturbed zone and in the native formation surrounding the borehole. And there's some other types of instruments that are more specialty, core sampling and near surface soil measurements. So we'll start with the borehole logging. Uh, so, so basically this is a borehole logging tool, small diameter tool, and this is a sort of a representation of where the sensitive zones are. So this tool has magnets, permanent magnets in the, in the sensor, and it also has induction coils in, in the sensor in the same vicinity of the, uh, of the magnets. And so the, the magnets cause the polarization of the hydrogen atoms in, in these uh, native formations surrounding the tool. And the induction coils perform the excitation and detection function. Uh, one thing about interesting about the um, borehole logging tools, most tools are used in groundwater have this sort of design where you've got these sensitive zones that are thin cylinders that surround the middle of the tool. And the reason these, uh, these sensitive zones are cylindrical is because the magnets in the center cause a, a field that varies radially as you go away from the, the center of the tool. So the static magnetic field is decreasing as you move out. And therefore, the resonant frequency at which you can do the NMR signal is also decreasing as you move from here out, radially out. So by selecting a particular frequency at which to do your NMR measurement, you are effectively selecting a particular measurement zone. So some tools have multiple measurement zones, and the way you achieve those is simply by tuning the coil differently and doing measurements at different frequencies. So you basically get multiple shells that extend at different depths of investigation. The other thing about this that's really important to understand is that you're going to, you're going to, with a logging tool like this, you're going to only be measuring water right on that cylinder, in that cylinder. It's very thin, typically only one or two millimeters is, is typical. So it's a very well-defined geometry where you're actually doing your detection. And the key thing is you want that shell to be in the native formation, not in the disturbed zone. If it's in the disturbed zone or if it's in some combination, the NMR measurement is going to report whatever is in that shell. So uh, one other thing is NMR cannot be used, NMR logging cannot be used in metal casing. That's because it operates at high frequency, typically you know, hundreds of kilohertz. And um, a metal casing will will shield those fields and not allow the alternating fields to escape into the formation. Okay, so here's a here's an example of how data go from uh, 
an, an NMR logging tool and a data, data set are processed and interpreted. So on the left here, you basically have at each depth, you've got a different measured NMR decay curve. And these are shown just down a color scale here. So you see where there's longer, longer uh, signals like here and shorter signals in here. So this is the actual measured data here as a function of depth. And the next, uh, next window here is the T2 distribution. That's the time decay distribution, which you can also consider to be a relative pore size distribution. So here where you see the longer lasting uh, NMR signals, you see more water showing up in these larger relative pore sizes. And then by taking a cutoff, applying cutoffs on the time decay distribution and integrating, then you have your total water content here, which is the entire curve. And you can segment and estimate fractions of clay bound, capillary, and mobile water content. These are again just estimated based on cutoffs that are hopefully, you know, based on uh, something that's um, known properties for the particular material. And then your hydraulic conductivity again comes from a uh, comes from a, a model relating the NMR measured property, the NMR measured parameters to the hydro the hydro hydraulic conductivity and transmissivity is finally just the integral of the hydraulic conductivity. So um, I'm going to show a few interesting, I hope. Uh, Examples here of NMR logging. Uh, the first one is in a, a groundwater resources investigation. This is the city of Denver, Denver, Colorado, and um, they have a uh, long term uh, water 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 issues to support their growth in in that area. But they have some uh, some very productive and permeable aquifers beneath the city. So what they're trying to assess is whether they can take water that is that's some years they may have excess water available to them in the South Platte River. That is, there's more water than normal because of excess, um, larger than normal runoff due to snowpack or whatnot. So they would like to be able to take that water from the river and inject it into these aquifers beneath the city just to store it for later use. These aquifers are deep and um, generally they, they kind of slope down from the Rocky Mountains foothill, foothills here and then kind of like a bowl shaped geometry underneath the center of the city. So the trouble is they don't have very much information on where these aquifers are and what their properties are beneath the city of Denver because it's highly developed in that area and it's just it's not easy to find. Uh, there's not a lot of new wells going in that they can use. So a few years ago they uh, decided to do some exploration drilling to char try to characterize these aquifers and they specifically wanted to use geophysics and specifically uh, NMR logging to characterize these aquifers. So these wells were drilled um, in seven different areas where they didn't have much information. Uh, the drill cuttings as they were coming up were quite concerning to the hydrologists who were running the project because they really weren't indicating aquifer materials. It was kind of a big uh, combination of broken up shale and clay and it wasn't until they did the uh, started doing the NMR logging in particular that they started to breathe easier and they said, OK, there are aquifers down here. So here's a couple of uh, NMR logs from two wells that are not very far apart. And so this is the sort of data that you get from an NMR log. These are just we're just showing here is the uh, mobile water content. I think things are really interested in this application where what's the mobile water content, which is basically the effective porosity, how much water can be stored and moved. And second, and probably most important, is the permeability. But you see, um, these aquifers, their characteristics, both, both the, in terms of their hydrogeologic properties and their depths, they, they vary quite a bit, or even over a few kilometers here. So this is exactly the sort of information they were looking for. For example, this upper Arap Arapaho aquifer, a little bit off to the west at 40th in Colorado. It's it's a, a much more productive aquifer with higher permeability and bigger sections of of good aquifer, aquifer material than it is just three kilometers or four kilometers to the to the east. And then the lower Arapaho, it's the opposite. 
over to the east, it's much more uh, better aquifer in terms of uh, storage potential and recovery than it is uh, a few miles off to the left east. So these um, these measurements were, I think, very cost effective cons considering the cost of just drilling these wells was about $200,000 a well. And these wells were immediately abandoned. They were just drilled only for the purpose of getting the geophysical data. All right, um, a couple of quick examples, I hope, on the um, a, a geo geotechnical application. Um, this example, this was in London, UK. Uh, they were drilling boreholes to characterize sediments underneath the Thames River for the purpose of planning to build tunnel, at least one tunnel, maybe two. And um, so this kind of gives you the uh, sort of the information uh, idea of the information that uh, you can get. These are the um, permeable zones, mostly sands, although it's quite uh, quite mixed, interbedded, uh, more consistent clay in this zone. Again, sand, a little bit more clay. And um, the hydraulic conductivity was a, an important, knowing where these sandy zones were was a very important for purpose of having to dewater this before, before and during and possibly even after construction of this tunnel. And uh, another, another project um, nearby was to characterize this um, this sort of river crossing here for putting in another another bridge. And this is a quite different uh, geology they're interested in here. This is chalk underlying sort of silts and clays. And so in the NMR data, this is showing the pore size distribution of this chalk formation. First thing you'll see is look at the look at the porosity. It's 50%, really high porosity. And it seems like it doesn't really vary that much. That the the um, properties of the of the chalk, but you do see these small variations that um, that indicate, you know, just find changes in the pore size geometries at different depths here. And I'm not a geotechnical engineer, but I think these are the these are the properties they were looking for. And um, anyway, they uh, based on probably some of the geophysics and also the costs, I guess they decided not to go forward with this project and um, I think the costs may have been um, assessed as being high because of what they found in the geotechnical investigation. Okay, uh, finally, last uh, example here. You can also deploy NMR tools by direct push. So the previous examples were in uh, boreholes. Those were both open borehole logging. And this is an example of a data set with um, uh, direct push. Let me see, I think I've got an extra slide here. That's OK, so I've got two slides doing the same thing. But anyway, here's the more updated one. So um, direct push instruments, uh, basically kind of like a small miniature drill rig. If you haven't heard of it, just kind of you can hammer or push down your, your rods. And this is a typical data set from a geoprobe tool that measures electrical conductivity and hydraulic conductivity. And so this is uh, two sets of data, HPT tool and NMR tool, both at the same site. And so the NMR tool, you see this really nice um, high resolution image of the, the pore size distribution, the total water content, bound and mobile, clay bound, capillary and mobile. So it's just showing a very nice correlation between the high resolution HPT data it's another measure of hydraulic conductivity that can actually measure over a wider range than the HPT direct push tool. And you're also getting all this information on the water content and porosity. So summarizing the uh, magnetic resonance borehole logging, the value is really you're, you're measuring water content and porosity directly. And you're also getting a a continuous look at what's the relative pore size distribution, at least the water filled pore size. So it's not a direct measurement of hydraulic conductivity, but it's it's a very good relative measure. And in some, some types of sediments and formations, I think it's it's good quantitatively, especially in um, unconsolidated materials. I think we've got a very good handle on the, the models there. 
can operate in open or PVC case tolls and also by direct push. It's got high resolution. You can log to thousands of meters, just depends on your tool. And um, I think the most important thing for applying this is you got to make sure you're using a tool that's going to get your sensitive zone out past the drilling disturbance. That's always the biggest issue, especially in groundwater wells where you've got, especially in monitoring wells where you've got a PVC casing and then you've got an annular space around that. Typically in the United States for a monitoring well, you have to have two inches of a minimum of two inches of um, annular space between the outside of the casing and the drill boring. And that's filled with either some sort of filter pack if it's a uh, if it's in a screened interval or typically grout if it's in a non screened interval. So if your sensitive zone is inside there, then you're going to be measuring the NMR properties of the grout. And most people don't aren't really that important don't really care so much about that. They want to know the native formation property. All right, surface NMR. This is actually my favorite. Um, so this is basically a, still an NMR measurement, but it's completely different in the way that you're trying to obtain the data and the type of instrumentation that's being used. So I alluded to earlier, you don't have permanent magnets here. You have one permanent magnet, it's the Earth. You're using the Earth's magnetic field. So you're doing these measurements in the Earth's field. You lay these typically pretty big loops of wire on the ground. Uh, you do your transmitting and detecting. Typically you have to deal with noise sources, so you put out additional uh, reference loops to measure the noise and cancel it. That's a very important uh, technique. And this is the sort of data that you get. It's not super high resolution like you get with the uh, NMR logging tools, but nonetheless, I think it's pretty good. It's typically better than a time domain system. It's more more on the order of a, a high resolution uh, resistivity in terms of its vertical resolution. So how does it work? Well, I think we've already described this, but basically you got, you're in the Earth's field, so you have to know what the Earth's field is when you're doing this measurement. So you can measure it locally, typically. Typically, you don't need to. There's uh, online map, uh, Earth's field map models that are very good that we typically rely on ourselves. And so you have to know the orientation and strength of the magnetic field so that you know what frequency to transmit at. So you transmit on this big loop, and then you turn it off. You just, this causes excitation in the ground of the, of the water, and then it, you get the spinning of the protons, and then you use the same loop to detect those. So one thing that's different here is that you, you have to run different current levels through here. So you run a, through a range of current levels when you're transmitting because the, the water that's in the very shallow subsurface is going to give you the biggest response when you use a small current. And the water that's deeper, it's going to give you a bigger contribution when, the, when your current is much higher. So this is this is how we get information on which to image vertically through this process of just using different current uh, amplitudes. So typically we range over at two orders of magnitude, different current. So for data processing and interpretation, here's your measured data. This looks a lot like the uh, NMR log. It's just basically your time decays here stacked, but this is not on a function of the y-axis here is not a function of depth at this point. This is uh, basically pulse moment, current pulse moment. So these are the large current excitation currents down here, and these are the small excitation currents here. So what we do is we take this um, set of data where we know how much current we transmitted. We know the size of the loop. We know the Earth's field and orientation. And so we do a, a geometric model that relates these measured data to a model of how the Earth would respond at different depths. And then, so it's basically just set up a simple matrix equation, solve it, it's a, it's a relatively simple spatial inversion. And the output of that is a set of NMR signals that are now sorted in terms of depth. And they're also, they're also scaled with respect to 100% water content. So 
then the next step, so you basically you can look right here and you can say, all right, well, there's an aquifer there and there's one there and there's not much here, not detecting much water here, but they see two, two areas with long signals, one here and one there, and a little bit of a break between. So uh, you can do the same sort of multi-exponential fit that we do in the um, borehole logging to get a relative pore size distribution. That's what you see here. And it's the, basically the same, same modeling to estimate bound and mobile water content and permeability from those. So the key difference is here. The, this relies on an inversion, whereas the borehole logging, it's just wherever the sensor is in, in depth. OK, there's some very important limitations for a surface cinema. It's really cool because it's power. It's really powerful to be able to sit on the top of the earth and directly detect groundwater and to even image it and quantify it. But it does have its limitations. And the main th main limitation historically has been noise. So you've got this big, huge loop out there. You're detecting a really small signal, hundreds of nanovolts, sometimes tens of nanovolts on this big loop. That big loop is really a good detector for all sorts of noise as well, particularly um, you know, power line, harmonics. So this is an actual example here of uh, measured data. This is not um, uncommon to see this sort of amount of noise. And this is actual data where we've used this technique where we put these uh, reference coils out towards the noise sources. So we're recording the noise independently as we're recording the NMR data. And then in post-processing, we use adaptive signal processing to cancel the noise out. And it works really well a lot of the time. This is a typical example here where uh, the blue signals before we applied the noise cancellation, the red signals after. And you see this beautiful, clear NMR signal here where before you saw nothing, it was just so noisy. So this is really, that innovation in particular has done more than anything else to make this technique commercially viable, I would say, and and a bit, um, viable for use in a lot of in a lot of areas. So a second uh, limitation or difficulty is if you're in magnetic geology. So in magnetic geology, you have these um, the Earth's field is no longer uniform in these in the subsurface. It's going to be have gradients on a large scale, like over the size of your loop. Uh, and I see I'm going to have gradients on the order of the pore size, pore scale gradients. So that causes the, when you have this effect, it causes the relaxation times to be artificially, or it causes them to be faster than they otherwise would be if it was a non-magnetic. So we do have pulse sequences now, like the CPMG sequence, that can still measure the pore size related time decay, which is really what you want in, in the presence of magnetic geology. But there still are some, some situations where the magnetic field gradients are so high that you just have difficulty detecting anything. That's just a limitation. It's a physical limitation of the technique. And lastly, the depth of investigations, and it's another uh, limitation. You basically are limited by about the size of the loop you can put out. And the size of the loop that you can put out is sort of limited by the amount of current and voltage you can apply to it safely and you know without going to extremes. So uh, you know you may see references that say uh, 150 meters is the maximum depth of investigation. And you may be able to get 150 meters if you're in a highly resistive geology and you're in a low earth's field like you can, you can in South Africa, for example, low earth's field so you can get more current through the loop. But I think the sweet spot for this technique is really like less than 100 meters. And, and less than 50 is where you can really get high resolution data usually. So this is an example. This is the same one we used in the introduction here. So this is uh, it's going to show what the actual subsurface looks like here. You have uh, the top 10 meters is silt and clay, and then there's a sharp transition to the sand and gravel alluvial aquifer. Water table here was about six meters, so you see you're starting to detect water, but it's in very small pores. And you don't detect all of the water in silt and clay. That's another limitation of um, surface NMR. It's not able to detect the water that's in the smallest pore sizes. 
And uh, so you have sand and gravel, and then this limestone formation below, which kind of surprisingly had the highest permeability estimate and quite a bit of mobile water content. Uh, another example here, this is from Nebraska. These are both, uh, this is a groundwater resources and modeling um, project from a few years back. And um, again, you see the water table in this case was about uh, five meters. You have a silt and clay, lo um, loamy silt and clay down to about 10 meters. And there's an alluvial aquifer, which is clearly uh, imaged here in the in the surface NMR. And below that, there's a Ogallala sandstone formation, which is kind of a semi-consolidated, still high permeability, but um, probably not as high as the alluvial aquifer. Uh, so one of the other things is you have to have an understanding of like what what is the maximum depth at which I can interpret this data? So just looking at this, you wouldn't really know. You, you may misinterpret and say, well, there's there's no water below 60 meters, but that's not true. In this case, we just can't really detect or image it below about here. And so, um, you know, most of the modern software that do these sort of inversions also give you an output like this that says, OK, here's sort of the limit at which you can interpret this data reliably. So it's not like you get like an instant instant fall off in your sensitivity, but below a certain point it does drop off quite rapidly. So I wouldn't interpret I wouldn't try to interpret this data below 60 meters for this particular uh, data set. Another Another nice thing about uh, NMR measurements in general is that they're they're generally insensitive to the electrical conductivity of the fluid itself or even the subsurface. So what they are you're basically doing they're directly sensitive to the water, the hydrogen, and also the pore size. So that makes it valuable in sort of a lot of uh, saltwater intrusion or anything having to do with um, ambiguity where you get uh, <clears throat> high electrical conductivity in the subsurface because of the fluid conductivity. So in this case, we had a <clears throat> groundwater investigation here. This is just north of where we are. And um, the study area is here, this little island in this low spot between uh, this residential zone and this one here. So in this this particular area, you see this river coming in here. This is a important uh, salmon and steelhead um, river, the Stillaguamish River. And so it discharges into Puget Sound here. And the um, Fish and Wildlife uh, Department wanted to, they owned this piece of property. They bought it because they wanted to turn it back into, it was, historically it's a marshland. They wanted it and they got converted over to partial use and farming. They bought it. They wanted to flood it. They wanted to knock down these levees and flood it to create uh, habitat for juvenile salmon. So that all sounded great until these people started thinking, hey, but what if they flood this with salt water? We've got our uh, groundwater wells here. This is going to cause a problem. It's going to intrude in our, you know, we're start getting salt water in our wells and in our drinking water. So you had lawsuits and everything else, which is kind of typical, but Anyway, so we did geophysical surveys here, and um, there were um, we did a, a number of uh, surface NMR and did some direct push NMR in these two areas here, and <clears throat> this sort of data that we came up with from these studies. This is a direct push uh, NMR log from that site over on the east, and we also did electric direct push electrical conductivity, and you see that this. The electrical conductivity here increases and then you get to about two ohm meters and it's just straight. So there's a transition here at about five meters between more fresh water up here and much more brackish water down here. So the, um, the electrical conductivity was really not relating, at least below five meters, was not really telling us anything about the aquifer structure or the aquitards. It just seems kind of random and very high in general. The NMR data clearly just shows the, where these uh, 
aquifers, aquifer units are, where the breaks of, are, and um, in particular down here at 20 meters, there's this really hard clay that comes in. And that's that's going to have a, and that's we found this was consistent across the uh, the island there, wherever we've done measurements. So that was uh, kind of an important feature that wasn't known. And a couple of uh, surf surface NMR measurements here, they also are able to define where see and define where these aquifer units are and where the silts are. So these are sand and gravel. There's silt. This these were in the same spot. This is the NMR direct push NMR logging. This is one surface NMR, and this is one of these uh, CPMG sequences that is less susceptible to the magnetic effects. And these um, sediments were fairly magnetic because they derived from uh, volcanic um, outwash from the Cascades here. This is a 2D, on the top there's a, finally a 2D resistivity line across a, a segment there and then a 2D NMR in the same area. And because of the salinity of the water, groundwater, there really isn't any contrast at all in the 2D resistivity survey at this site, where the, uh, the NMR 2D uh, survey shows some interesting breaks, especially in the lower aquifer. You see the upper and lower aquifer units here, but the, um, the lower one seems less continuous, which was interesting. All right, so I'm almost done. Uh, there's a few other um, kind of niche type of uh, NMR measurements and techniques. So I'll just go through quickly here. Um, one is uh, a man portable, a person portable NMR logging tool. So this is basically the whole thing. You've got a, a little toolbox sized um, transmitter and a probe and so you can walk around with this. A person can walk around with this. And here's some data that was acquired in Australia using this tool. This is um, a kind of a, a very rare type of um, peat lake that is in um, Western Australia. And it's been stressed because of reduced rainfall and so it's uh, it's got a lot of unique uh, features and qualities and it's under a lot of uh, study by environmental uh, scientists. So they they believe uh, that paleo dunes in subsurface are a key to, are a key control on the uh, the groundwater here and the lake itself. So their, their interest in getting some subsurface data out here. It's obviously very difficult to access, certainly not by a sort of a ground vehicle. So um, they use this tool where you can walk out there and had some existing monitoring wells that were installed by direct push um, NMR. And this is one of the data sets they got out here somewhere at one of these locations. And so there's very clearly, there's one of these paleo uh, sand dune, sand channels right here. And uh, just above it is a particularly um, low permeability feature with the uh, water and small pores. So this is um, data is very useful for this this type of project and the ability to just go in and um, hike in somewhere with the equipment is it's kind of a, it's unique. It's in it's a um, it's got uh, value of its own just to be able to go in and do small scale. NMR measurements of soil or sub subsurface sediments. This is um, an example here, Crested Butte, Colorado, where uh, scientists were um, trying to get a handle on, get some information on subsurface water content in the top couple of meters on, on the slopes of this valley, just over time, monitoring, basically long-term monitoring over different uh, seasonal cycles. Uh, snow melt, saturation, and drying out in the summer. So this is this is one of these tools here. There's the the logging tool doing a measurement in one of these shallow wells that were installed. Here's a couple examples of data from that study. This is early in the summer, June 2017. So 
the ground is probably at its highest saturation at this time of year because the snow has just kind of the runoff period from the snow melt is just kind of in in the later stage where most of the water is now in the ground and it's moving down the slope towards the river and lower part of the valley. So you see this site here, that's the basic uh, water content profile in, at that location and, and here in the top meter, meter and a half. And then the same locations later in the summer, probably close to the driest part of the year, you see that there's been a you know, say a large change in the in the water content, so soil water content, and both vertically and along that hillside. Uh, finally, um, this isn't maybe uh, geophysics per se, but um, this you know NMR can be used on core samples as well, and it is uh, to determine the same sort of properties that you would try to determine with a geophysical measurement. So in this case, you have a, it's still doing an NMR measurement of the same type, but in this case, you've got a different type of magnet array. Typically, the magnets are surrounding the sample, and you put the sample inside the device to do the measurement. So uh, you get the same basic data reduction and um, processing and interpretation. It's just um, you're operating with samples instead of putting something in or on the ground to do a measurement. All right, so thank you for this opportunity. Um, in summary, I would say that the unique val value of uh, magnetic resonance is you directly detect water. And um, that's that's unique. If you're interested in water and the um, hydro hydrogeologic properties, um, you get very direct um, measurements that are directly related to those parameters of interest. Now, surface NMR, it's non-invasive. The key, the key value of surface NMR is you don't have to drill a well. That's what it comes down to. And it still directly detects water. Uh, it does have its limitations, but you know, I mean, that's that's a large uh, that's a large uh, value. When you can use it successfully, it's very uh, it's very cool. And borehole NMR, uh, the key thing here is to make sure that your sensitive zone is actually out in the native formation and you're not sensing in the um, in the disturbed zone of the drilling. All right, well, we've had uh, quite a bit of uh, funding for this research that we've been involved with over the past uh, 10, 15 years. So I need to uh, acknowledge that from the Department of Energy and have a lot of uh, great cooperators who have been involved with us when we've developed these tools and applied them in research uh, environments. All right, I think I'm done. Um, <clears throat> perfect, Dave. Thank you very much. This was a great presentation and um, great overview of an NMR capabilities and case studies. Um, I think something happened to your video feed because I can see it's um, disappeared from um, from the stream, but your presentation went through perfectly and your voice uh, went through perfectly. I don't know if you want to try to switch your camera on and off um, under, um, under MS Teams. Maybe that will... Okay, I just, okay that's perfect. I just tried to cycle. I'm just okay, gonna... All right. That's perfect. You're back. Thank you so much. We have a few questions from the audience. Um, there's actually several questions from Ray Durham, um, who's asking, what is the length of the interval measured for various shells for stationary and continuous measure? How is signal to noise defined? Okay, so for, I assume this for logging tools. Yep. Let's see. And the so the length, I assume that's talking about the vertical extent of the sensitive zone. Well, I can just um, start, sort, sort of answer here about the vertical ex extent of the sensitive zone is determined by basically the size of the induction coil that you use for transmitting and detecting. So okay. typically a half a meter or a quarter of a meter is that is that length there. Uh, the vertical, the extent that that can be changed. You know, it's it's a design parameter that can be changed, and 
different tools have different trade-offs that go along with that. Uh, as far as these radius of investigation, this is actually um, to, to scale for a particular size of, um, of tool. So I think this one is for a three and a half. This rendering was done from a three and a half inch diameter logging tool. And these four range from 10 and, 10 and a half inches diameter here to about 15 inches there. And the signal to noise ratio does improve as you get closer. So this shell here is going to have typically twice the signal to noise ratio as the outermost shell. And the reason for that is mainly because this, this shell is much closer to the detector. So you've got a detection coil and it's just going to be more sensitive to something that's here than something that's out there. So the trade-off is always you want to have high signal to noise so you can have a lower variance in your data and also faster logging speed. But the trade-off is a lot of the time you may end up in this unknown disturbed zone or in some part of it. So it's useful to have multiple shells. It's not necessary, but it's useful. That's perfect. Ray is also asking, what is the order of magnitude cost of an uh, and the mass system for surface surveying and for a person portable NMR? OK, um, for a uh, surface NMR, I can just can I can tell you what our equipment we sell it for. Uh, we sell two types of surface NMR system, two products. One is um, has a depth of investigation of about 50 to 80 meters, and that sells for about 100,000. And then our full powered one, which has a deep, that sells for about 160,000. Is, is that US dollars? Yes, US dollars. OK, okay perfect. And um, the person portable one is again about $80,000. OK, perfect. Uh, um, Jeff, Jeff uh, Campbell is asking, what is the range of radial penetration distances for the borehole tool? Good question. So, so every every tool has a, a different zone, basically. So we, the tools that we uh, develop and manufacture, it depends first and foremost on the diameter of the tool. So we have uh, tools like that person portable one. It's uh, it has one in three quarter inch diameter. The tool itself. And it sees that in radial shells or diameters of five and six inches. And we have. Uh, another version of that tool that sees at nine and ten inches. Uh, this intermediate size tool here, this is a 60 millimeter. I'll try to try to do what I can in uh, metric here. 60 millimeters diameter. And its zones of investigation are nine and eleven inch diameters, so it's it's out here. The bigger the tool, the bigger your zones of investigation, basically. So you always want to run the biggest tool that you can deploy in whatever borehole or well, because it's going to see out farther. If you got a a bigger boring, you got to use a bigger tool. I mean, bigger in terms of a, a larger diameter. So the very biggest tool we, that we use as five and a quarter inch diameter for the tool and the largest sensitive zone has a diameter of 21 inches. And so that's useful for large for large diameter production wells of which in the United States it's not uncommon in the Western United States for production wells to be drilled. A pilot hole would be 17 to 20 inches. So all around the world people have different types of drilling and um, well construction, so you just have to. Uh, this is the key thing. Just make sure your tool, whatever you're using, it's going to be out there in the native formation and keep it centralized in the borehole. We have a question from Kimo. Uh, for surface NMR, what is the typical size of the loop? Also, what is the maximal area aerial extent that can be achieved with this kind of survey? I'm trying to understand if this is not labor intensive, if much ground needs to be covered. 
So the largest, so the typical loops, there is not really a typical loop size. You want to use a loop that is a little bit bigger than the maximum depth that you're interested in investigating. So if your investigation is all, you're only interested in the top 10 meters, you can use a loop that's 10 or 20 meters. And it's actually better to use a loop that's smaller for that type of investigation because you get better resolution and typically better signal to noise and better noise cancellation. Now, if you need to uh, investigate to a depth of 100 meters, you should be using the biggest loop that you can uh, put together. 150 meters is what I would use. So the thing is that this is all based on the magnetic fields that are generated from this surface loop. And if you take a circle and you look at the mag magnetic, magnetic fields generated by a current loop of that size, they vary quite a bit within that first radius or even down to about one diameter. You get good variation and that's what gives you your ability to resolve in depth. But the sensitivity overall really plummets off a cliff once you get down below about one coil diameter. That's why you need to use a big loop and the loop should be at least as big as your depth of investigation that you're trying to achieve. Now there was another question about aerial extent. Maybe, could you clarify that question a little? Uh, I'm going to try to, um, just one second. I'm trying to get back to the um, actual question. Um, okay, while well, I'm trying to clarify, <clears throat> clarify that, I'm going to move on to the next question. Terry Hodges uh, is asking, would surface or borehole NMR be useful in the exploration phase of fracking applications? Well, uh, surface NMR is only going to be useful to, you know, like 100 meters depth. So if you're fracking at, at greater um, depths than that, then surface NMR is not going to be probably that useful. Certainly if you're down like thousands of meters, surface NMR can't get anywhere close to that. Okay, the next question is from Brad Pitts. Um, is there any potential for using repetitive measurements to monitor sinkhole formation? Hmm, um, with surface NMR, I think. Yes, Probably. yeah, yeah. If it's filled with water. So the thing is, if it's a sinkhole that is filled with air, you're not going to detect it. If it's a sinkhole that is filled with water, I mean, that's what you're detecting. You're imaging the water, not not the not the rock or the absence of rock. It's the absence or presence of water. Um, that's an interesting application. I think it, yeah, I mean, it's, it certainly could be useful if, if you've got a sinkhole that's developing and it's filling with water, bulk water, that, that would be very easy to detect and identify because bulk water that's in a big void like that is going to have a very long relaxation time compared to any water that's in any sort of uh, sediment. Perfect. Ray is asking, the results in the 90s showed that the mag gradients above 100 nanoteslas under the loop um, equals poor data. Mm -hmm. Question, what is your experience? Um, let's see, I'm going to have to try to figure out what 100 nanoteslas. Let's see, you got 40. I'm trying to figure out how much of a shift in the resonant frequency it is. Let's see, 42.1 times. Uh, that's only a four, four degree. So you basically what that does is it causes a spread of your NMR frequency by about four, four hertz, that much of a gradient. And so I would mm -hmm. say that these days that's not that hard to deal with. Um, so the reason is there's a couple of reasons. One is um, back in the 90s, the instrumentation that were available at that time, they had a very long dead time and there were no oh, there were no sort of spin echo or advanced pulse sequences to deal with the magnetic uh, dephasing is what was happening. So I think uh, back in those days, that would be probably a, a very difficult detection scenario. Um, 
more modern instrumentation has a much shorter dead time. So you can basically what happens when you have a magnetic field gradient is you get this rapid dephasing of the signal. So it um, you have to be able to detect earlier in the let me see if I can find a slide and demonstrate. You have to be able to detect earlier. So actually, the, the way the pulse sequence goes, you, you do your transmit pulse here, and then there's a, a dead time between transmitting and receiving. And so if you're in a very high gradient, this signal, instead of being nice and long like this, will be super short. And so that's what was preventing detection, and it still can if you have a, a certain degree of magnetic um, field variation. But you can also do refocusing pulses like this, which cause the signal to sustain and come back and refocus at much later periods in time. So I don't think it's nearly as limited as it used to be with magnetic geology, but there does come a, there is a limit. You know, you get to a certain point where the magnetic field gradients at the pore scale and at the loop scale just get so large that you can't detect anything or it's very difficult. Perfect. The next question um, from Susan Webb. Um, how long does a surface measurement take? How long does it cost per station? And would it be possible to combine measurements with CSMT? Uh, it's a good idea to combine measurements with some sort of um, electrical resistivity profile. That's because the inversion to get to get a unless you're in a known very resistive subsurface, the inversion is going to depend on knowing what the resistivity profile is, at least having a, a decent model for it. So the NMR, the NMR inversion benefits from a resistivity profile. Uh, now second, how long does a measurement take? Um, it takes a while just to set it up. You know, depending on the size, if you've got a big full power system like this, you got to get it out of your truck, you got to lay your loops out. It can take a half an hour or 40 minutes just to get it set up and then tune in the loop. The amount of time you have to, the, the, is required for data acquisition depends entirely on the signal to noise. So we've, um, we've done um, plenty of times in lo low noise environments or where we could cancel noise effectively. We had perfectly, usable data within 10 or 20 minutes. We, I mean, we could just stop right there. Sometimes you have to sit there and average for a long time. Sometimes, you know, half a day is not uncommon, you know, three hours. So when I advise people who are interested in uh, using it on a project, I would say, you know, given the effort that it takes to set, set up in the field, and the time associated with that, that you should probably Without knowing anything else, I would say figure on doing one or two sites a day until you get quite better knowledge and proficiency with it. And so what's um, the cost? The cost would be basically, you know, what what is the labor? It's basically a one person job, except you do you do need two people typically to pick this stuff up. So you want a you want probably your best geophysicist to somebody who's really motivated and interested to be the lead on this sort of thing. It's, it's a bit trickier than it is, uh, you know, a, a time domain survey. There's more things that go into, you know, making sure, you, you know, you get these noise loops put out properly. This can have a big impact on the data quality and the success of the, of the survey. Um, so the costs will come down to your labor costs and, you know, whether you're buying or renting or already own this equipment. I mean, and that's perfect. <clears throat> Another question is uh, also from Susan Webb. Is the input field or is it analogous to analogous to uh, passive seismic? And could you monitor changes in water level? So you can monitor changes in water level to the extent that you can resolve that. You know, with surface NMR, this is a typical resolution. It's your resolution is better at this close to the surface and then it tails off as you get farther away. Um, I would say it's not the best. It's not the best application monitoring water levels unless you have really big changes like seasonal changes that are caused in your water. 
table to drop by 10 meters or more. Um, it was the, so the first part of the question I've forgotten. Um, is there an input field or is it analogous to um, passive seismics? I'm not sure. It's it's a um, you are transmitting. It's active. So OK, there is an this, input field. This equipment is generating really huge current uh, pulses, like 600 amp pulses on this loop. You might be able to see there's this big loop out there, the yellow. So um, there's a lot of power generated and the, you know, you got 4000 volts on this, the terminals of this loop when you're transmitting at maximum power, 4000 volts and 600 amps pulses going through here. Perfect. We have another question from Anonymous. Um, what is the depth and pressure limitations on the borehole tools? Well, I have, uh, you know, it depends where, who's made the tool and what the purpose is. So, um, you know, oil field NMR tools are, you know, they're designed to go 20,000 PSI, you know, six miles deep and, you know, 150 degrees Celsius. Um, our tools are the ones that we uh, produce. Uh, they range from the dart, which is really only 100 meters, so it's got a very thin wall. And um, the deepest tools, the tools with the highest pressure and depth rating that we're involved with, uh, you know, 2,000 meters in terms of pressure and 70 degrees C or temperature. And not all of our, not all of the tools that we make are are even that high. They're designed for groundwater applications. They're not designed for ours. Are not designed for oil, oil and gas. Perfect. We have another question from Ray Durheim. What sort of sp station spacing would you use when profiling when searching for water bearing faults or dike contact? Hmm. Uh, I I wouldn't know where to uh, start. I would have to. I would have to um, know more about the um, the site or the sites and uh, what sort of scale of investigation it is. I will say that if you just have a single loop, you really are only sensitive to basically what's right underneath that loop. So this loop here is not going to be sensitive very, it's going to have little sensitivity to groundwater that's underneath this spot. So it is pretty, very highly localized. So if you've got a fracture running through here and you do a measurement here and then you skip that and you do a measurement here, you're likely to miss it with surface NMR. Perfect. We have a clarification regarding the previous question that um, Susan Webb was asking um, regarding the um, um, regarding an input field. The question was related to the for a small portable system. Is there an input field or is it similar to passive seismic? Um, I know my understanding passive seismic is just listening and it's from just other other sources of. Um, of seismic activity are are the source. Uh, so I think. I guess I still don't quite understand the question, but we definitely create the signal with NMR. NMR okay. is not passive. You generate a magnetic field that causes an alternating magnetic field that causes this precession and this rotation of the hydrogen. And then you that's what you detect. You detect that hydrogen atom rotation and the magnetic field that it generates. Perfect. Um, we have another question from Jeff Campbell. I'm going to read this out now. Does the surface method use an on site generator or bank of batteries to power large currents required? Question from Jeff Campbell. Typically, a couple of batteries. There's um, a group in Denmark who developed a surface NMR system that runs on a generator, but that's the only one I know of is that uh, group in Denmark. So our, our all of our equipment runs from a couple of car batteries. You can see them here. A couple deep cycle batteries are, are good. Yeah. 
and and the way the current pulses are generated, it's not directly from the batteries. At least with our equipment. The batteries charge a DC converter and you see this box here. That has some. Um, 12 very large capacitors in it. So. Basically this this part of the system takes the 12 the 24 volts from the battery and charges it up, charges these capacitors to a varying amount of voltage so that we can control different amounts of current going through the loop. And so the current the current pulse comes straight from these capacitors. Perfect. Um, Dave, I'm gonna I'm gonna just double check that we've covered as much as we could in terms of questions. If I did leave anyone out, I do apologize up front. There was quite a lot of questions was coming from the floor. Um, Dave, on that note, if anybody has any questions regarding the presentation, um, could we pass on your contact details so they can approach you and chat to you directly? Yes, absolutely. Perfect. Um, Dave, once again, a huge thanks um, for taking the time to take us through it. Um, if you if you can, please join us for a catch up on the Google uh, Meets link that I've posted in the chat, the chat window. I also send it to you, um, send it to you via Skype. If you ever find yourself in South Africa, um, please uh, give us a shout. We'll we'll keen to host you for dinner if you ever have the opportunity to to come through. Well, I plan to. Thank you. I appreciate that. As soon as the uh, as soon as the circumstances allow. Yeah, absolutely. We live in the challenging times. Once again, uh, Dave, a huge thanks um, for presenting to the SAG community um, and have an awesome day. OK, thanks. Thank you. For I'm going to keep. I'm going to keep the stream going just for everyone to for another couple of minutes um, just for everyone to um, use the link. Uh, that I've posted for Google Meets and join the um, Google Meets catch up session afterwards. In this session, everyone can talk and can, um, you know, ask questions, show themselves on camera. It's one of the ways that we try to catch up. The Saga, Saga community is a fairly small community, so it's nice to see that everyone's doing well and um, just to catch up in a fairly informal session. But I think the presentation was excellent. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. Oleg, I don't see the link in my chat window. I'll send it to you now. I'll send it to you via Skype. OK, all right. And you should receive it. Yes, I see it. OK, thanks, Oleg. It's a pleasure. We'll see you just now.